Hi class, this is Marcella. For this lecture, we're going to be going over the history of forestry in Minnesota. And it's really important when we think about the history of forestry to realize that where we are now is because of where we were in the past. So our past influences the present and the future. So where, where we're going in the future is really dependent on what happened not only 100 years ago, but what happened 10 years ago. So it's really important when we think of forests because these forests are long-lived entities. Forests have long lifespans. So forests are influenced by the past, by the present, and how, how they're going to change in the future is really, really dependent on understanding this history. So we look at the pre-settlement forests of the Great Lakes. And this figure is from... Um, the U.S. General Land Office, so it's a reconstruction from their records, and it's based in the mid-1800s. So when we look at the Great Lakes, so Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, we see that Minnesota is pretty unique. We have this broad range of forest ecosystems. We had this broad range of forest ecosystems. And then another slide I'll show we still do. But in Minnesota, we see we go from this yellow and this aspen birch and the purple, this boreal, um, and the green, these pine forest barrens, all the way down to northern mesic forest and oak forest and savanna. So we have this huge range of forest types in Minnesota. We see in modern day, we see a shift not only in what type of forest, but where these forests are located. So we see a change in where there's huge areas of forest cover. So this modern forest is of the Great Lakes states from 1977 to 1983. So even this is this map is a little um, outdated. So, um, and this is reconstructed from the forest inventory. So this is reconstructed from the Forest Service's forest inventory and analysis. So as we look at both pre-settlement and um, current forests, we're going to be talking about what shaped these forests. So our pre-settlement forests from these general land office surveys um, in, 19, or in 1850, it's estimated that there's about 80.5 80, 80 hectares of closed canopy forest. And a lot of this forest is composed of hardwood. So over half of this area, um, when we're looking at it in the Great Lakes, we're looking at hardwood, so oak, maple, maple, hardwood. And we see this, so these this lighter green color, this northern mesic forest, and we see um, oak savannas. We see these broad areas of both oak savannas and northern mesic forest across uh, much of the lake states. In Minnesota, we're pretty unique, though. So we have these areas of of these mesic forests, but we also have large areas of red and white pine and jack pine and spruce fir and birch and peatlands and oak. So we have this really broad range of forest communities in Minnesota, which is unique when we look at a comparison of Minnesota to Michigan or even Wisconsin right next door. We see there's a difference in the forest communities that we had. So these early Minnesota forests and forests in the Great Lakes states in general, just from the descriptions, from these past writings, from um, pictures and images, just had to be magnificent, especially when we talk about white pine. And white pine is really one of the huge drivers of forestry in the Great Lakes. So Agnes Larson, a historical writer, describes white pine as these trees that stood over 200 feet tall with diameters of five feet. So just these huge, beautiful, powerful trees. So looking at the history, not only of forests, but talking about the state of Minnesota, we have the Minnesota Territory in 1849. And we see that we're beginning to already see a century of land clearing in the southeast. And this land clearing is for forestry, but we also see this start to establish agriculture. Um, so we have the first mill happening in 1821, 
and that's our first sawmill at St. Anthony's Falls. And we see St. Anthony Falls in this little yellow pin on the Google map and also this older map um, we see Fort Snelling. So this first sawmill was to supply timber to Fort Snelling. We saw our first commercial sawmill in the state of Minnesota in just a few years later in 1838. And the big driver of this commercial sawmill <coughs> was white pine. And looking back at um, the pictures of these early logging, um, early logging was a dangerous, hard, hard life. You were really produced, you were expected to produce a lot. And we're not talking about having the same safety conditions that we're talking about today or even 50 years ago. Um, you can see in the bunkhouse sharp, sharpening saws. You can see um, these huge, huge logs that these men are standing next to. And then we can see um, this huge amount of wood that's awaiting transport on the Little Fork River. So, um, Logging was not an easy profession. It was a hard lifestyle. One thing that did help move a lot of logs was the railroad. So 1870, the railroad comes into Duluth. Um, and we saw shortly later the first mill at Cloquet. So logs could be transported from Duluth to other places. So we're seeing this mechanized transport. Um, and we see these people uh, loading logs onto rail cars. Well, this early 1870s, 1890s, this was a time of really destructive logging practice. And remember, we're talking about destructing log if, logging. Logging, these destructive logging practices were not forestry. This was all extracting the highest amount of product, the highest amount of timber that they could. This is not forestry, this is not silviculture. But we do see, at the same time, some very early beginnings of sustainable forest management. So one of the first ones was the tree bounty law, where you were paid in 1871 for planting trees in prairies for windbreaks. We also saw the development of the Minnesota State Forestry Association, and Itasca State Park. So there was this early push in Minnesota that there are these really special places that should, um, shouldn't be destructively logged, should be preserved. And we see that with Itasca State Park as an area that even now people go to because of its rich history. So we have these destructive events. And after a lot of these destructive logging events, there's huge amounts of slash. There's, it's a messy environment. And we see that after, often after these events, there was large fires. And one of these really notable fires that shaped Minnesota history is the Hinckley Forest Fire of 1894. It was extremely destructive, not only when we talk about areas of acres burn and the, and the forest impact, it also had a huge impact when we're talking about humans and society and, and people in the central Minnesota area. It had a huge impact on them. And this led to the development of a chief fire warden in 1895. During this time, we have huge destructive logging events, large fires, and we often, this is often described as the golden era of lumber. So we have, during that time, there averaged 1.5 billion board feet removed yearly during 1890s to 1910. So around 30 years, there was a huge amount of, of wood removed. And, and this peaked at, in 1899, it peaked at 2.3 billion board feet. And the majority of this was white pine. So think about this. We're talking about 30 years and most of the removal was in white pine. So just imagine how, how in 30 years these destructive logging events 
really shaped our forests in Minnesota and in the Great Lakes. And to put this in perspective, we're thinking about 600,000 two-story homes. So just a huge amount of infrastructure was built from our forests. And we're see, we have to take this history into account. What we're seeing now is shaped by these events. What we're seeing now, um, how our forests, our composition, our structure has been shaped, both good and bad, by this, these logging events. So this couldn't last forever. This huge extraction of material couldn't last. Um, and it was estimated that within 20 years, all the pine would be cut. So there was this, there was people blowing the red, raving the red flag. This is not going to last. We need to shift. This is not good. Um, and we see this shift. We see that already um, in about 20 years from 1910 to 1929, we see that shift. We see the Virginia and Rainy Lake Lumber Company close its doors. And this is a really big deal because it's considered one of the largest white pine lumber companies. And it's estimated that 68 billion feet, board feet of pine was harvested. So lumber companies could either shut their doors, um, not going to get white pine anymore, or they could shift their focus. So they could shift to saw logs, to pulp, to paper, and building materials. And we saw this shift happening in the 1930s. This was also the time when we're talking about this push for restoration and sustainable forestry by Andrews. A state nursery established in 1903. We have the Cloquet Forest Experiment Station established in 1909. Minnesota Forest Service established in 1911. And the big focus of the Forest Service was to focus on fire protection and suppression. So there's this, there's this shift of thinking from extracting to protecting it. We also saw that the Civilian Conservation Corps, so huge during the Depression era, really helped rebuild these forests. And that's, again, we have to think about it. How our forest looks are because of our past history. So the CCC, there was 166 camps in Minnesota, and they planted over 25 million trees. They established state forests. They built infrastructure. They built roads. They did this huge, they had a huge impact on our natural resources in the state of Minnesota. And this is one picture um, on the Chippewa National Forest of a CCC construction of a dam. We see, again, we begin to see this shift from extraction to sustainability and sound forest practices. We, there's Minnesota added additional state forest lands. The first forest inventory was completed in 1955, and we saw an expansion of the forest industry. So this forest industry was really based on these shifting products. So this changing, this realization to stay in business, this needs to be sustainable. We also have this forest, the Sustainable Forest Restoration Act and the creation of a task force, the Minnesota Forest Resource Council in 1995. So all, all these aspects have influenced where we are now. And we see this in our current forest types. So just for right now, I just want to briefly go through um, some of the major forest types in Minnesota. And we'll talk about a lot of these forest types in more detail later. But this is mainly to give you an idea what we have um, in the state. So this broad, um, this broad forest type um, kind of... Some of the types are pretty similar, but these are slightly more um, detailed, detailed, focused on Minnesota. So there's a few more than what we're seeing here. So we, we have spruce fir, jack red and white pine, maple, basswood, birch in yellow, oak hickory in this tan color, 
elm, ash, cottonwood, and maple in the red, non-forest, and lakes. So we're seeing there is a difference in what we're seeing now than what we saw in the past. And so just briefly going through these forest types. So we have our aspen birch forest types. Main species, we have quaking aspen, big tooth aspen, paper birch, or white birch. So these this forest type can be in pure or mixed stands, and they occur on many different site conditions. These species are generally considered shade intolerant. So remember, shade intolerant um, means ex is exactly what you think. They're intolerant of shade. They don't do well. Um, these plants have a hard time establishing over in an overstory, so they need kind of more open conditions. These forest types, there's many uses, including pulpwood, saw timber, veneer, and they're extremely important when we talk about wildlife habitat. So here's just one image um, of kind of what, what this aspen birch forest type can look like. Again, all these forest types are very diverse, so this is just a broad overview. Now we have our black spruce forest type, so a bit different. So main species, black spruce. And black spruce can be in pure or mixed stands. And when we're talking about mixed stands, we're talking about tamarack, tamarack, <laughs> northern white cedar, balsam fir, jack pine, and some hardwoods. Uh, moist organic soil, so we're talking about weather site conditions, generally considered shade tolerant, and we talk about uses as pulpwood, Christmas trees, and black spruce are pretty important when we talk about the spruce grouse. So again, broad picture, common black spruce stands in northern Minnesota. <laughs> Bottomland hardwood forest type. So this is a very variable forest type. And common species include American elm, green ash, black ash, Eastern cottonwood, silver maple, black willow. So really diverse, diverse amount of species. So we're talking generally moisture sites and waterway. And what species you're going to have is really dependent on the site. Again, and this is very variable when we talk about its uses. But generally, we think of this as a very important um, ecosystem when we talk about wildlife, both um, when we talk about um, mammals and fish. Uh, uses include lumber, veneer, and firewood. So here's one example. This is a park setting, but we see these species such as cottonwoods, willows, um, and other species as very important across a lot of our waterways in Minnesota. Eastern white pine forest type. So we saw our history really influences how much of this <laughs> this system so we prior to european settlements prior to those really destructive logging events eastern white pine what we're seeing now is very different than what we're seeing in the past so main species we're talking about white pine um it's right now it's a common component of other forests it can be a common component of other forests think of it on well-drained soil so sandy loams. Uh, we describe it as intermediate shade tolerant and one of the main uses is lumber, but it's also a very important wildlife species. We also can talk about jack pine forest types. So uh, jack pine, one of the main components is jack pine. It's mixed stands with red and white pine. So these are the kind of pine barrens that we talked about, that we saw both in our historic map and our current map. And we see jack pine can occur with aspen, paper birch, oaks, black spruce, and other lowland conifers. So jack pine is really found on well-drained soils and uh, often found on sandy soil. So it's very tolerant of xeric condition, very tolerant of low moisture condition generally considered shade intolerant. Jack pine's mainly a pulp species. If you've seen it, you know it's not extremely pretty. It's pretty hard to work in. Um, young stands are important when we talk about hiding cover for hares, 
older stands are important for the herbaceous cover. Um, young stands are also important in Wisconsin and um, Michigan. Those young dense stands, that was one of the main species when we talk about Kirtland's warbler. So Kirtland warbler is an example of a species, a bird species, that really benefited from good forest management. So here's a picture of jack pine. Now we have the northern hardwood forest types. And this is again a very diverse set of species that occur in northern hardwood forest types, ranging including sugar maple, American basswood, white ash, black ash, yellow birch, red maple, balsam fir, aspen, and many other species. This composition mix is really going to be site dependent and really going to be influenced by moisture by your site history. So again, dependent on site and geographic range. Generally, we think of northern hardwood forests commonly on moister, well-drained, fertile sites. So these northern hardwood forests generally occur on some of our better sites or some of the best sites when we talk about um, both moisture, so well moist but not too moist, so it's kind of in that sweet spot, and generally more fertile sites. And these northern hardwood forests can be very profitable, including saw and veneer logs as well as pulpwood. Um, we can also think of maple syrup and wildlife habitat. And here's just one example of a northern hardwood forest. Again, very site dependent. A northern hardwood forest in Minnesota, um, in central Minnesota, is going to be different than a northern hardwood forest in northern Minnesota and is going to be different than a northern hardwood forest in central Wisconsin. It's all really, really based on both site and your history. What happened? What's happening? Oak hickory forest type. So species include a lot of different oak species, including northern red, white, burr, black, northern pin, and many different um, hickory species, including bitternut, shag, shag bark, and butternut. So there's a lot of diverse species um, in this oak hickory forest types. Generally, we think of drier sites. We saw uh, on the map both current and past that these oak hickory forest types, these oak savannas, were generally more in the south, uh, south and central portions of Minnesota, both Minnesota and Wisconsin. So drier sites, range of densities. Again, that range of densities and the species is really going to be influenced by what's disturbing it. So was it fire? Um, has it not been disturbed? And uses include furniture, flooring, and other goods. And again, good for wildlife habitat. So here's just one example, little denser um, oak forest, oak hickory forest. Um, so again, really going to be variable based on where you are and what your history was. Northern white cedar forest. So species include northern white cedar in pure and mixed stands with lowland conifers like white and black spruce, tamarack and upland conifers like eastern white pine and hardwood species. So these generally occur on moist so soils that are neutral or alkaline. Generally considered shade tolerant, um, really liked by deers. So <laughs> uses include lumber and deer yards. So deer really like northern white cedar forest and other lowland conifer forest types as um, cover during the winter. So here's an example of a northern white northern white cedar forest type. It can be pretty dense, pretty um, lots of down dead wood, pretty hard to work in. So red, red pine or Norway pine forest types. Again, one of the main species we're talking about, red pine, uh, that's in pure or mixed stands. And this is really getting back to those uh, pine barrens and pine ecosystem. So red pine with jack and white pine, aspen, paper birch, and oaks. Generally on well-drained sandy to loamy soils, um, shade intolerant to mid-tolerant, so um, kind of more light-loving. 
and uses include pulpwood, lumber, cabin logs. So here's an example. I'm sure a lot of you, as you've been driving around the state of Minnesota, have seen red pine. And for those of you in the lab, we'll be looking at some of this red pine during our first field trip. So now we have our spruce fir forest type. So species include white spruce and balsam fir, but can also include black spruce, aspen, and paper birch. They're generally well-drained lowland, intermediate to shade tolerant. In shade tolerant. Uh, and generally we think of pulpwood and wildlife habitat. And these spruce fir forests um, can be on moister sites, they can be on a little drier sites, but these are generally not um, the most productive sites. So generally kind of wetter, kind of slower growing, um, but very important when we're talking about cover and other wildlife habitat, and also for pulpwood. Um, Spruce, white spruce in particular, is a very important component um, in the paper making process in Minnesota. So paper companies like Blanding, like Potlatch, will really pay a premium for getting high quality spruce, white spruce. So now we have tamarack or eastern larch. Uh, species include larch in pure or mixed stands with black spruce. Northern white cedar, black ash, red maple, red maple, and paper birch. Very moist, wet sites. They're bogs or peatlands, shade intolerant, and the uses include pulp, poles, and lumber. Generally considered a low economic value, but they're great gray wolf's great gray owl habitat. So very pretty in the fall as well when you get these mixed stands of tamarack and black spruce as they change color. Well, as the tamarack lose their needles and change color. So the primary forest, it was estimated that we had about 900,000 hectares. And much of this was in northern Minnesota. Um, or we, we have an estimated 900,000 acres. And much of this is in northern Minnesota in the Boundary Waters and in the Swamp Conifers. So what's next? So we see we see our current forest type, um, and we'll focus on and this focus on Minnesota and the Great Lakes. So we see Minnesota. We have this area of aspen birch, um, maple birch beech, and these oak hickory. So this is a little different. So this is using slightly different tools than that previous um, current forest type, and then we're projecting it into the future into about 100 years later, what are we seeing? We're seeing a shift. So climate change may impact, is expected to impact our forest communities. But really what it means for us now, currently, is this is gonna impact how we're going to manage. How do we make sure our forests, um, whether we maintain aspen and birch or whether we shift to oak hickory, how do we maintain good, healthy, resilient forests that meet our needs and those needs those are getting back to those big overarching goals and object those goals that we talked about um, previously uh, in that civil culture prescription so what are our goals healthy forests biodiversity so how do we manage our forests now to make sure now and in the future we're maintaining those goals we're meeting those goals so that